Hello, my name is Gil Penalosa and this is Cities for Everyone, the webinar. Every other Tuesday, I invite fascinating people from around the world to share experiences and knowledge that will help us create affordable, equitable, and sustainable cities. I was born in Bogota, Colombia, where as commissioner, I led the design and construction of over 200 parks and took a small program called Ciclovia, open streets, and increased it to over 120 kilometers, 75 miles of car-free streets every Sunday and holiday where more than a million people walk, bike, run, shop, enjoying the presence of each other. 17 years ago, I created 880 Cities, a nonprofit organization based in Toronto, Canada, where I live. Last year, I ran for mayor and came second with 100,000 votes. My aim was to change the conversation in creating a Toronto for everyone. I've been fortunate to have worked in over 350 cities in all continents, sharing and learning. Based on all experiences, I developed master classes and keynotes customized to each city. But Cities for Everyone, the webinar, is a way of giving back. It's always free and hopefully always interesting. Please invite others to join us every other Tuesday, anyone who cares about cities and people, equity and sustainability, about all living older, healthier and happier. Hello, my name is Gil Penalosa, and this is the bi-weekly webinar, Cities for Everyone, where every other week we try to have interesting topics with fascinating presenters. Half of the session are presentations, and then we have a dialogue with participants and all. Today is about well-being by design. About one third of our well-being is based on genetics and healthcare but the majority, over two thirds, is about the built environment, it's about the social interactions, it's about nature. That's why today's topic is applicable everywhere and it's so important. Well-being by design, and our guest is Antonio Gomez Palacio, who originally is from Mexico, but he's li been living in Canada for many, many years, and his partner and chair of the very successful planning firm, Dialogue. Welcome, Antonio. Good morning, Guillermo, and thanks very much for, for the invitation. Um, I, I gotta say, you, you and I have known each other for, for many years, and we've probably been exploring similar topics for, for a long period of time. Um, it, it's a real joy to be able to join in your in your webinar and have a little bit of of this conversation. And I'm also hoping that we can engage in a little bit of a conversation. So I'll give a little bit of a presentation to get us started. But frankly is I'm asking more questions than I'm finding solutions um, and still exploring and, and testing things out in, out in the universe. So I'll talk a little bit about the journey and a little bit of kind of some of the things that I'm exploring these days. And, um, and then we'll open it up to see what uh, questions and thoughts others may have. So um, I'll talk a little bit about this absolute conviction that how we engage with the world and the, and the built environment that we engage with through design, through living it, actually has a reciprocal um, premise with our well-being. It influences and we impact on the world. So the question is, can we do this with intentionality? Can we in fact bring purpose into how we engage with the world and how do we engage with each other. But I'll start with a little bit of, a, of an origin story, just so that people know a little bit of, of where I come from. And, and I love this photograph. So that's baby me in the middle of this photograph. But I love this one because my two grandparents, I think it, this is the only time I ever saw them wearing a tie. So you see my parents in, in the center, my grandparents on the side, but I was born in Mexico City and lived there for 27, 27 years um, and kind of really grew up in, in that, that context. But there was a couple of seminal moments uh, for me and in many formative um, uh, years and many formative instances. 
But one of them, well, and this is me, a few years later, I was trying to tease out, you know, when when this might be, and I think it's somewhere around nine years when you're losing using your teeth. But 1985, September 19th, Mexico City was hit with a massive earthquake. And at that point, a huge amount of the structures around the city were, were damaged. The block where my grandmother lived, her building was the only one left standing. I ended up spending, as a 15-year-old in the city, um, weeks helping out in any which way that I could. And the politics of the country changed as a result. There was all kinds of things that changed as a result. But 15-year-old me, um, it wasn't until many years later that I realized some of the impacts that these things would have had. Sure enough, a couple of years later, I entered into architecture school and was truly starting to think and tease out uh, some of the bigger questions that I was confronted with certainly aspects around how we live as a society. How do we create spaces for each other? How do we build affordable housing? And that exploration took me a couple of years later into um, Hong Kong. I heard that the British government at the time was building uh, affordable housing for 20% of the population. In this, the Kowloon Walled City, Guillermo <laughs> referenced some photographs that I was digging up over the weekend. But you can see in the foreground, this was a, a forgotten city in the middle of Hong Kong and all of the affordable housing being built around it. But when I was there 30 years ago, this is what it was looked, looked like. This is housings built on top of each other. Um, one image I particularly have vivid memories of is standing on the top of all of this ad hoc construction in the flight of the flight path of the airport and the plane zooming above this. But at the same time, you can see in the background of this, a tremendous impetus in creating solutions for hard pressing problems. But if we fast forward 30 years, so where are we today? This is back into, into Mexico City. But at a global level, we are still in a place where the vast majority of the world population is living under the poverty line. Wealth distribution continues to be polarized and extreme, and there's vast amounts of world population who do not have the basics needs of everyday life. And this is not just humans. Of course, we're starting to have a huge impact on the environment. So the incidence of extreme weather events continues to increase year on year on year. And if you simply look at the amount of fires happening around um, all countries around the world, or the fact that we're breaking records on the heat levels this summer, um, this continues to be compounded. And simply within the majority of our timeline, uh, lifespans, the, this issue continues to be compounded as the world populations continue to increase year on year on year. And simply since I started in practice and somewhere around there in the early 2000s, we transitioned from being a majority of a rural population historically to being a majority of an urban population. So think about it. After thousands of years of human history, we are at a very seminal moment. There's a couple of things that have happened. Guillermo mentioned the fact that half of world population historically is alive today. But even in the last couple of decades as well, we are now a majority of an urban population. And in fact, simply since the moment that I was born, we've started to inhabit a planet where that can no longer replenish the rate by which we are consuming um, elements on this planet. And historically, this is extremely recent. Us as a, as a human population have only recently started to live in a condition where we're living outside of our means. When we're now doing all of this in cities, when the world population is at this extreme. So it's really hard for us to imagine that we would actually learn how to do this well 
when historically we've been doing it for so recently. Think about it in biological terms. So if I was to ask you which of these two apples you'd bite into, well, we have no doubt that you would bite into the one on the left. The one on the right looks horrible to bite into. We have millions of years of biology to tell us which of these two apples contributes to our health and well-being. But if I was to ask you which of these two urban environments do you think contributes to our health and well-being, well, you'd like to think that people might answer the one on the left. And yet it's the one on the right that we continue to build over and over and over again. So again, the question is, how recently are we confronted with these problems, problems of our own undoing? And what is the wealth of experience and knowledge that we've actually developed and have the ability to embrace and be able to confront with some of these issues? So a couple of hypotheses I'll throw out for you, and then we'll tease out some opportunities in all of this. The first one is that the shape of our we shape our buildings and afterwards our buildings shape us. So this is a phrase coined by Winston Churchill when they were reforming the, the um, distribution of seats in parliament. And they were literally arguing how could the, the, the shape of the building, the distribution of seats contribute to either a more acrimonious or a friendlier relationship between parliamentarians. And of course, I'd rather put the photograph of my kids who coincidentally looks a little bit like Winston Churchill in, in, that, in that photograph. But think about this premise. There's a reciprocal relationship between the decisions that we make on a day-to-day -day life, the architects, the planners, um, but also myself in how I think about my home or my, um, my environments on a daily basis, and then what I get out of that the impact it has on my psychology, on my relationships with family, with neighbors, with all of those kinds of things. There's a huge reciprocal back and forth relationship here. And if we, if this is true, it has a huge implication for how we even start to think about our environments. Take this now, that premise, to the entire planet. And if you think that as a society, as a, as a world population, we are in fact for the first time in human history, having such an impact on the world that it's actually starting to shape and change the the uh, the whole um, the whole world's um, natural systems, and of course we're living on that on a, on a daily basis. So the term the Anthropocene refers to this era where now humans are the dominant factor shaping the um, world world uh, geography and and ecosystems. So Vancouver, but this is if you just forward a couple of years, this is the projection of the sea level rise in Vancouver. So it's hard at this point for us to deny the fact that us as humans are now having such a big impact on the world that it's actually changing all of the world's environment around us. But if this is truly reciprocal, it's also starting to have an impact on ourselves. So open almost any newspaper these days, and you start to see how the effects of climate change as a big world phenomena is already starting to shift the migration of world populations. It's having an impact on communities. It's having an impact on the day-to-day -day life of people. So if this is happening at a global scale, it's also happening at cities, neighborhoods, homes, offices, on our daily and day-to-day -day basis. Think about it simply in terms of your own life. If you look at what are the causes of premature death, so not dying of old age, but anything before that, 60% of all premature deaths worldwide have to do with the environment and our behavior within it. Do you walk to school? Do you walk to work? Do you engage in behaviors? Um, and is the environment around you conducive to behaviors that are conducive to a healthy lifestyle or not? This is huge. Only 40% have anything to do with genetics or the healthcare system 
or you know the the access to that to that healthcare system. But we're not there yet as a society. We haven't figured this out yet. So only four percent of public resources actually get spent on that sixty percent that has a bigger impact. We're spending all of our resources dealing with health and premature deaths at the reactive site. When somebody has already had a heart attack instead of the 50, 60 years before the heart attack. So think about this. If we truly believe that how we design our environments and the impact that we have on the world has a feedback loop and it has starts to have an impact on ourselves, we need to start to think about this differently. Okay, so park that for a second. The second hypothesis that I'll throw out there is that we've in fact created this false dichotomy with how we think about work and business and the economy and all of these things. For some reason, we've polarized the notion that I can run a business or I can have a purpose, but I can't have both, right? That being an advocate of um, out in the world is contrary to going out and being able to earn earn a living that you somehow have to compromise your values and your purpose if you're going to make a living i would argue that this is in fact a false dichotomy that we need to start to think about how the impact that we have on the world our ability to actually have a positive impact is in fact the value that we add into into the world and that is in fact how we can earn a living how we can create a business how we can support an economy how societies can thrive in themselves as much socially and, and ecologically as economically and it's not just me saying this of course we're starting to see all kinds of different people um say this right Larry, Larry, uh, think has been going out, and you know if if the um, the CEO of BlackRock is already starting to argue that profits and purpose are not inconsistent with each other, you know that the um, we're already at a at a turning point in terms of understanding this element. But you start to see other folks. Um, Peter Diamantes uh, is also arguing that not only are the big world problems, um, not they're not an encumbrance. In fact, they're an opportunity. And whoever really tackles these bigger issues will have the, uh, the ability to, A, earn a sense of um, their purpose, but also the thanks of humanity, but also actually generate a tremendous amount of opportunities and wealth along that side. Um, if you haven't run across Afdel Aziz and Bobby Jones before, look them up. They uh, recently wrote a book that titled Good is the New Cool. But they, in fact, argue that we are at a really critical point right now in terms of this particular argument. And that is kind of a shift in perception at a mass level in terms of how purpose and business and profitability are starting to align. So they see and they point out at three factors. One is, well, conscientious consumers. People are starting to really ask for green, ask for positive social impact, ask for things and really trying to understand how things are in themselves manufactured or generated or come to be, and what is the impact that they have on the world. And they're making their choices based on impact and purpose. Second one, as you saw from BlackRock, is impact investment. Investors in real estate, investors in finance, investors in many other areas of the world are also looking to understand the impact that they have on the world. So investment from being agnostic on impact is really shifting to become a place that is a center point and an argument for understanding what is the impact that it has on the world. And lastly, and I see this on a day-to-day -day basis, is activist employees, people who in themselves are entering the profession, are entering their jobs, are looking for places to work and to engage with 
where they can truly have a sense of um, a positive impact on the world. And this becomes a motivator for, for the work, but it also becomes a motivator for the type of work and the environments where they want to engage with. So what, what does this all mean and how does it start to come into a little bit of a confluence? Dialogue is the company that I am, I am part of, but think about your own world. Think about the places that, that you inhabit and the places where you are engaged in how a sense of purpose and a sense of an impact onto the world is being driven, driven or not. For ourselves, this is our, our mission statement. Right? to meaningfully improve the well-being of our communities. And we embraced this now almost a, de a decade ago, but we've spent the last uh, many years really trying to tease out what does this mean. And I'm sure each one of you in your own worlds and environment is embracing a kind of a similar parallel uh, sense of purpose and trying to tease, tease this out. I'll talk a little bit about our experience, but really... With the, with the impetus of inviting others to find, find their own purpose and their own journey in it. Ultimately, what we've been trying to achieve is this sense that we recognize there's these big world problems out there and they seem daunting in as much as they're bigger than what I alone would appear to be able to, to tackle. Climate change, social equity, mental health, cultural alienation, Right? But if we start to unpack them and we start to see that my day-to-day -day decisions have a huge impact on that environment and how I start to design and build and, and, and construct the build environment can have an incremental and positive change on it. So then the next step really is, well, we need to engage in a conversation around this. We need to find others. We need to find that constituency of, of participants, of people who are willing to undertake a sense of purpose and, and be guided by the impact that they can have on the world and really start to design the environment, to start to think about what are the interventions that we can start to make. And then, well, start building that environment, right? Driving that deep into projects, driving it deep into having an implementation aspect of it. And then the feedback loop around looking at what it is that it happens on the day-to-day -day life and how that can have a positive influence and how the, the maintenance, the operations, the, the, the kind of the learning that we can gain from that will allow us to always be on a positive, positive cycle. We've, um, as an organization, we're now B Corp certified. This is another one. If you haven't looked at what B Corp is, increasingly there's businesses that are becoming certified in terms of um, their ability for the business to be structured as a force for good. But I don't see it as a kind of a past looking certification. I see it really as a commitment, right? As an ability to really focus on how you're generating something now in the future that is gonna start to continue on down, down this path. But within this, we've really started to test, and I'll invite your own your own thinking um, in terms of how we can start to unpack and start to host this conversation if the built environment, if how we design and engage with the built environment can truly have a positive impact on the world. So a couple of things that I'll throw out to you, five, five key, key ideas. They have to do with people, ideas, project capabilities, and, and a sense of leadership. So the first one is about engaging people. You know, this is where I love exactly um, this conversation. I've been spent the last 30 years and I anticipate many decades for now trying to find the, the, the people who will be guided by, the, the, by a sense of purpose, but also by um, wanting to have a positive impact on the world and getting that a constituency of people, be it. Um, people that I work with or the clients or the stakeholders or neighborhoods that are really passionate about trying to understand how what they do on a day-to-day -day basis has the potential to have a positive impact. And then thinking through what are the right methodologies, what are the right systems, what are the right um, mechanisms to empower 
people to really start to drive down that path. That photograph is um, Martin Nielsen standing on a table there. But this particular project is some of the uh, the folks at the office recognized there was a derelict um, train track in the middle of Vancouver. And they started to design and think about it. Long story short, the city launched this whole process and now it is actually a, a project and, it, and it's happening. But it emerged out of the passion. It emerged out of the sense that people recognized that there was a problem. They engaged with each other. They looked at solutions and designs that could have a positive impact and they implemented. And now they're, now it's actually happening. Once you have an amazing group of people come together, the next step is really the ideas, the innovations, bringing forward some of that collective knowledge that is going to allow us to really push the envelope on the environmental impact, on the social impact, on um, addressing aspects of uh, accessibility, of mental health, of culture. How can we start to learn from each other? How can we start to bring innovations in one discipline or one industry into the other and start using all of our conversations, all of our environments to really start to push this ideation? And I talked about earlier how it's really very recently in the history of humankind that we're having this accelerated impact upon the world. So we have to be that much more intentional with developing the ideas and the innovations that in sharing these and harvesting them across the board to really be able for us to address some of these strong, big, hairy, audacious issues and problems that we see into the world. So if you've got the right people, amazing people and great ideas, innovations, the next one is really to start driving them deep into projects delivering these, testing them out, exploring. And I see that every project that we do, do at the office is very much an opportunity to have that impact, to drive some of these ideas, to learn something further and to take those uh, lessons learned from one project to the next, to the next, to the next. Um, this is one project where it was really about um, turning an existing building, doing a deep retrofit, they build geothermal underneath an existing building and we're able to make it net zero and significantly lower um, all of the environmental footprint. But it takes a lot of creativity and innovation and testing and the license to be able to go out and, and seek to have a strong impact. So if you're doing these amazing projects, then the next step is really to start to build some capabilities and sharing those capabilities across industries, across communities, across um, different, different environments, building that knowledge base and that ability to develop methodologies that can really bridge um, the lessons that are being generated across the board and really be able to take those, those out. Because finally, it's really about inspiring those leadership. It's, it's about sharing the knowledge, sharing the experience, so that another community, another environment can now drive their sense of purpose, drive some of those innovations and be able to have an impact. If everything that we do becomes siloed and cornered in, in one space, the ripple effects are gonna be minimal. But if we put it out there, if we share it, if we engage with the world, then the impact is gonna be that much stronger. And all of this becomes a virtual circle. We start to engage more people, develop more ideas, drive it deeper into more projects, build stronger capabilities. And we need to be doing this all as a society. We need to be doing this as broader communities if we're in fact gonna wanna have the impact that we need to have on the world. So ultimately, you know, this drives back to this inherent belief that how we design, how we engage with the built environment and how we do this together has the capacity to confront the big challenges of our time. But it also has the capacity on a day-to-day -day life to have a huge impact on the well-being of myself, my family, my community, my environment. And that we need to be able to do this with intentionality, that we need to be able to recognize that simple things you know, how I lay out chairs in a park, are they fixed or are they um, 
or, 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 or people are allowed to move the chairs on their own. These things have a capacity to significantly um, influence the well-being of, of communities and the, and, and the broader uh, problems that we're trying to solve. And it almost doesn't matter what are the, some of the bigger issues that you're looking to embrace in your own world, social equity, accessibility, affordability, climate adaptation, climate mitigation. If you're always asking yourself, how does the design of this inbuilt environment, how is the way that we occupy these environments, how is the way that we nudge behaviors within people who are occupying these environments start to have a positive influence? And how are they pushing the dial forward in these environments? We have the capacity to, to tackle many of these things. The contrary is if we, if we don't believe that the built environment has this capacity, we're in fact building those cities of rotten apples. We're building those cities that inadvertently are contributing to the problem if we don't in fact recognize the, the impact that they possibly can have. And it's not just you know, ourselves, we're architects, planners, landscape architects, engineers, but you might be business leaders, you might be homeowners, um, uh, landlords, developers, you might be representing a city or a country, you might come from very different environments, you might be a school, you might be a student. You need to be thinking about how the choices that we make on a day-to-day -day basis, the choices that we introduce into the environments that we're inhabiting have the potential to have this extraordinary positive influence. And the ignorance of not doing it, the absence of not doing it, in fact, is inadvertently resulting in some of the consequences that we see today. So can we deliver well-being through design of the built environment? Absolutely. Can we drive deep into this a sense of purpose? We need to be doing this. We need to be having these conversations if, in fact, we're going to have the impact that we want to have on the world. So thank you very much. I'll pause there and see, Guillermo, if there's any uh, thoughts or questions that people may have. Thank you very much, Antonio. What a fascinating session. You provided examples about what each one of us can do as individuals, but also as community, and about having successful citizen engagement and the elements of leadership. I think that this is one of the talks that we need to get the recording and send it to our decision makers, elected officials, leaders, civic leaders, in advocacy organizations to the media, because everybody can learn from this. I truly appreciate you having accepted the invitation and having done such a great presentation. A lot of food for thought for everyone. Have a wonderful day and everybody will see you in two weeks at the same time on Cities for Everyone. Antonio, thank you very much uh, for coming and I wish you the very best. Likewise, and thanks, Guillermo, for the invitation and, frankly, for hosting these, this sequence of webinars, which are incredibly useful. Thank you.